One of my most frequently asked questions is like, how did I write a book? And honestly, I kind of want to say I have no idea, but I would be totally lying because I have a, a, a pretty rigid structure. So I thought I'd do a video on the 10 steps that I kind of roughly take to write a book. Let me start by just adding this. I am not in any way, shape or form the best writer out there. And you could probably get loads of advice from other people that could give you better advice than I could. But I'm asked a lot by the people that have read my book and want to know how I did it. So this is just another way of doing it, I guess. I will say this though, and I will toot my own horn a little bit. When it comes to like plotting out things, I'm, I would say that's where my strength is, plot and character. I wouldn't say my strength lies so much in uh, in the writing element, but that's why you have an editor. So the way that I learned to structure writing and stories and plots and characters is very much in a filmmaking, movie making way. So that will come into a little bit of the steps that I take when writing. I think personally, everyone brings their own experience of their life and what they've learned and what they enjoy to write in a book. And it kind of makes it hard to put it in specific stages because different things will work for different people. And this is just really what works for me. But these 10 steps can also be kind of just uniform to anyone's learning style and just give you those like little prompts into maybe just opening your brain, opening your world a little bit into storytelling, character development, and really just getting it down so that you can work it into something that's gonna be, you know, magical. So I am a self-published author. I've sold over 2,000 copies. And the last time I checked, I had around 100,000 100, page reads a month on Amazon KDP. If you're not sure what Amazon KDP is, I am doing a video on like the ups and downs of uh, publishing through Amazon KDP. So be sure to subscribe if you wanna see that, or you wanna check it out if you're interested. But let's get on to the 10 steps. So for me, the first step in developing a fantasy book is to determine the genre and the subgenre. So for example, I like writing fantasy books, but then there could be a subgenre underneath that, such as high fantasy, urban fantasy, dark fantasy, there's loads. So this step is really important because it kind of determines what your entire theme of your book is. So really think about that. Think about what it is that you want. Get that wrote down. Step two of developing my fantasy books would be going straight with the hard stuff and developing the world. What does the world look like. So you have to consider the history, the geography, culture, the magic systems, and obviously like the politics of your world. You can make that as detailed as you want or just as little as you want as well. I don't go too much into the politics because it's not something I enjoy writing, but it is something I enjoy reading. But when you're doing this, try not to fall into the familiar sort of tropes too much. It can make your, your world a little bit sort of feel recycled almost. Your world's ultimately gonna be the foundation of your story. So you have to make it as unique and imaginative and <laughs> to a certain extent believable. I would just create a map. That's the one thing I like to do when I'm doing mine, just create a map. What does it look like? Okay, then we've got this region, then we've got this region, maybe there's something here, why are they separate? That kind of process for me, making it a visual thing, really helps with the world building process. Okay, third step. I would say this is the most important step because for me, I'm a character driven person. I like to read about characters that I wanna fall in love with. So the third step is develop your characters. Now your characters are the heart of the story. These are the people that are going to make the readers fall in love with the book, with the story, what it is you're trying to tell them. So you really have to develop your characters so that they are completely all-rounded as well as being relatable. You need to know, if you was to have a conversation with your character, what it is that they would say naturally in their tone. How would they react? What kind of mannerisms would they have? So just some top liners to consider. Their personalities, what kind of personalities? How would somebody else describe them? What kind of goals do they have? What's something that they're really good at, like their strengths? What's their weaknesses? And I would say probably most importantly, what motivates them? Is it fear? Is it hope? What is it? Is it the fact that they're having to provide for their family? You know, what is it that motivates them? Get really in there with that. Okay, so now you've got your top three. You know your genre and your subgenre. You know where you want it to go and the feel and vibe of the book that you have. You know the world that they live in and you know the characters that you are going to create these stories around. So naturally, the next thing to consider is your plot. Where are you going? What story are you telling? I always start with characters before I start with plot because I don't know what would happen in a plot unless I know my character. Characters. If I don't know my characters, I can't tell you the plot. It's as simple as that. It's like asking somebody, what would you do without knowing them? You know, like it, it just, it just doesn't work for me. But now you know your characters and you know your world. 
so you know how they're going to react. So I think your plot needs to be something that is carefully crafted and obviously super engaging. The way that I tell stories is in a three act structure and that is basically the first act sets up the, the location, the people, who it is that you're going to be telling the story about and then at the end of act one something called an inciting incident happens. That is essentially a point of no return for the main protagonist, the main character. That can be something as simple as you know, somebody dies and she's having to take something on or maybe she finds out that magic is real. It could be literally anything, but the point in which your story is now projected forward into the plot is the insight and incident. And that happens usually within my structure at the end of the first third. But I think it's again, because I have wrote screenplays, I work on these movie moment beats. These are things that my plot line must hit these moments of either exposition or character development specifically to the character's arc, specific rising action points. It could be traveling, it could be going from one place to another, it could be discovering. These different things keep these rising actions, keeps the pace going. And then obviously you get to the climax and that could be a big war, it could be confrontation, it could be a breakdown, it could be literally anything it is that you want, but think about ultimately where it is you're wanting to get to, where are you wanting to see your protagonist, your main character get to. And you know, you could kind of work backwards from there and think about all the struggles and strifes that she's going to have, he's going to have, they're going to have on the way there. An important thing to remember with your characters as you are thinking about your plot is how they will develop. So we've touched on it just a second ago about a character's arc. And that, if you've heard that term, it literally just means somebody's development. How do they change as a person? What is it that they're going through and how is it affecting them? Do they become more resilient, stronger, sadder, happier? What happens to them? Because we all know in life, the more things that you go through, you change. And ultimately they might, they might need to change. They might need to change. For them to be who it is that you see them as at the end of the book should not be the same person you are introducing them as at the beginning of the book. You should allow that character to have room to change and grow and develop. So never go into the book with your character being who they are, who you want them to be straight away. Okay, step number five, establish your sort of magic rule system, your rules of magic. If you're doing a fantasy novel, it is very important, I think as a writer and as a reader to establish uh, the majority of the way that your magic system works pretty early on. So consider how magic works within your world, including its limitations, the consequences of using it, and obviously how it affects your characters and their surroundings. It could be everyone has magic, nobody has magic. It could be that there's different types of magic. We see a lot of that, like different types, maybe elemental magic, or it could be simply that magic is something that doesn't exist anymore. I always like that trope actually, you know, like Throne of Flask vibes. And it's ultimately the plot and discovery is, is aiming to get that magic system back. And if you are Doing a story like that you actually can get away with uh, you know keeping a little bit of the magic system held back and work through it as you're going through the plot but for your magic system it's important that you know how your magic works in your world who it belongs to what your consequences are of using it and how it affects everyone okay stage six would be to think about the villain of the story now the villain doesn't have to be a person it could be something else it could be a rot that's that's killing the land it could be the earth is dying that could be the villain. I will say it is easier for it to be a corporal version of a villain, it, but I do also like sometimes when I read books, things being more ethereal than that and it being taken away from this sort of person form of a villain, it could be something else. So obviously with your villain or, or your sort of your antagonist, let's say, treat them as a character, regardless of whether they are a character or not, if it's, if it's not a person, you still treat them as a character. You need to know what motivates them. Why is it that they're doing what they're doing? If you don't know that, it, it's the same as any character development. You cannot create a plot without knowing what motivates your characters and why they're doing what it is that they're doing. Give them a backstory. We love a good villain backstory and it makes their reasons and motivations way more believable. And it also adds tension to the plot because sometimes, you, you, you know, it, I sometimes prefer the villain. I'm like, no, you know what? I, I can see why you feel like that. So it also adds this different dynamic of, you know, enjoyment for a reader. I would say step number seven is once I know my characters, once I know my world, once I know the villain, the plot, I know everything that's kind of going on now, I've got it all sort of mapped out is the conversations. For me, conversations is a really great way of allowing the plot to naturally and organically flow in a direction that is believable to the characters. And all I mean by that is just right engaging dialogue. So obviously dialogue is, 
an essential component in any storytelling, but sometimes it can be used in what I think is, a, is sloppy. Um, and it's, again, I think it comes back to sort of my screenwriting um, history training that I've done. They always say in screenwriting, narration can be kind of lazy. If you have to use a narrator in um, screenwriting, you know, somebody has to tell you what's going on. You're not really doing a great job of doing it visually. Um, and I think that concept goes hand in hand with the show don't tell concept within you know novels and, and writing books and i feel like if you are ever questioning whether something that you've written is is good enough or is detailed enough or is engaging enough read it and and look at it yourself and say am i being told this or am i being shown this and dialogue is a huge pitfall for a lot of people i've seen where they'll use chunks of conversations for the expositions and it's not dialogue and it's not engaging because it's almost like you're just being spoken at. You know, you just sat there listening to somebody tell you everything that's happening in the form of dialogue. That's not engaging. It's not engaging to me as a reader and I find it really unengaging as a writer. I find it quite lazy actually. I do think that there are definite uses for it and, and needs for it, but it depends how often you use it that it become exhausting almost. I would say shorter, snappier dialogue scenes that keeps it engaging whilst also revealing information about your characters and their motivations. We say things without saying it and I think there's a statistic out there. I'm sure I could be making this entirely up, okay? <laughs> But I'm sure the statistic is something like 80% of communication is non-verbal. Okay, so step eight. When you've done all of that, all of those things, it's important to go back through and make sure that you are creating a memorable setting. And I don't mean that in a way that you have to completely go against everything that we know because you know, there's so much to be said about having something that is also relatable. You can you, you can actually relate because you understand it, you've seen it, whatever. For me, it can be quite a fine line between creating something that's completely memorable out of nothing, but also being relatable. I'll say just an example for this. In my book, there is a cafe that the main character works at, Lana. Now, the cafe is described in such a way that it actually describes the owner of the cafe and it helps you understand the situation that the the main character is living in so although this is such a small component of the locations that i'm telling my story in it tells so much more because lana our main character is having to go to work in this overly tired drab cafe with her loser perv boss and the entire environment that she's in is adding to the stress in her life and you can imagine the way that it's described it being a stressful environment and i don't just mean the way that it, it, you know it's operated i mean the way it looks the way it looks is like to me it's a headache it's checkerboard floors and you know ripped leather sort of booths red booths it's just when I was writing about that specific memorable location, I take into account this is not just a place, this is a, an ambience. Step nine, now we're getting to the good part, edit. Edit and revise your work. Honestly, oh, do you know if I read the first chapter that I wrote of A Crown of Cursed Love, I look at it and I think, Jade, I have learned so much, so, so much. And I will do a video on that if, you, if you're interested in it, in publishing my own first book. I've been writing stories forever. But publishing a book, actually editing it, publishing it, allowing people to read it is an entirely different thing. You have to be so much more analytical with the way that you are writing because I think sometimes as writers and as readers, we forget that the way that we think and, and perceive things is not the way that other people do. Somebody can read the same book as you and have an entirely different experience. So as a writer, it's important that you are allowing for all of those experiences without there being too much room on what did actually happen. You know, you've kind of got to guide them a little bit, but not too much that it's just boring. So I found a lot when editing it, there was things that I was overly describing that I didn't need to. I didn't need to hold the reader's hand as much as I were. I was worrying, for example, that they would forget that Lana's eyes were amber, but I was worried that they wouldn't, they wouldn't log that. Now me, as a reader, if you point something out specifically twice, I have logged it, I've actually tabbed it, because I know as a, as a reader and a writer, you're gonna bring that back round. You're, that, that meant something. But writing my first novel, I didn't really afford that trust, I would say, in my readers, that they would be able to pick up on those things. So sometimes I 
was dropping maybe a little bit too many crumbs. Now going through editing it and also having a couple of my girlfriends read it chapter by chapter and give me their thoughts and feelings I thought was so useful because it allowed me to understand where their mind was going when they was reading it. So I could go, okay, yeah, they're picking that up or oh shit, they've completely skimmed past that. They've not even read that. And that's a really important bit. Now I need to edit it and change it. So having that, I would say is so useful for me, the editing process and the drafting process goes through at least four phases in my own writing and editing style. So I would say I do a first draft, second draft, third draft. People read the fourth draft chapter by chapter. They then give me their thought pattern. This is before alpha or beta readers. And then we go to alpha and beta readers. By then, it's pretty much what it's gonna be. It's pretty much what it's gonna be. It's not been like line edited, so the grammar and stuff might still be off. There might be some tweaks that need to be done, but ultimately, most of the stuff has been caught by the time it goes to beta readers. It's just the vibe and stuff that I get from those. And then once the beta readers have read it and they've got their, you know, sort of take on it, and I'm happy with their take. Some people won't like it. Like, you've gotta get used to that. Some people won't like it. Some people will love it. Look at my favorite book, for example, Akatar. Some people don't even like that book, and I'm just like, are you? We all will never be friends, but what? So you have to understand that not everyone is gonna love the book that you write. They're not gonna get it and that's fine. They can read another book that they're gonna get. But when you go through that process, you get the different sort of, you know, I, don't, I wanna say like vibe and energy of what, what people are thinking about the book and it's really useful. And then you can go back and re redo those tweaks, remake those things. And then I would say one of the most important things is to make sure that you have somebody line edit it. Now, let me tell you, I had somebody line edit mine and I had a disaster and I will talk about it in another video. I had an absolute disaster with it. Essentially what happened is they sent me the file that I sent them. So I uploaded a version that had not even been line edited, which was a nightmare, but it's fine. Those things happen. My mom, my mom was like, Jay, don't feel bad about it. You know, Tolkien's first editions were like riddled with grammar mistakes. And I was like, okay, that makes me feel a bit better actually. But I would say, make sure that you go through somebody who was recommended instead of just going through Fiverr. And the last step in my 10 step little process would be to publish your novel. I will be doing a video on how I publish mine through KDP. So if that's something that you're interested in, make sure you subscribe. It'll be out in a few days, but there's multiple ways of publishing. You can self publish or you can submit your manuscript to publishers. And again, if you want me to do a video on that, let me know, I can do that. I have many friends who have worked in the publishing industry that I could get on a video with me and we can go through it and talk through it so you guys can have all the info. But ultimately those are my 10 steps on how it is that I sort of draft out a fantasy novel. Anyways guys, I hope you liked this video. It was a highly requested one, so I'm so glad I did it. If you liked it, make sure that you give me a thumbs up so that I know you liked it. Comment down below, which one of the stages do you think was most useful? Thanks for watching and I will see you soon.